Good morning. How are you? Good to see you. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Philippians. And we're completing a sermon series today that we began about six weeks ago, walking through the book of Philippians as Paul has written a manual to the church of Philippi, a church that he planted. Uh, he's written a, a manual on how to have joy in your life. We talked about this at the beginning of the series. There's a big difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based on happenings. It's circumstantial. But God wants us to live in joy, which means no matter what's going on in the circumstances, we can have this inner quality of peace, this inner quality of purpose in our lives uh, and of love because of our relationship with Christ. And how great is it that it just so happens that today Paul's going to talk about the issue of gratitude. And, uh, and he's going to talk to us about being grateful. And, and that's really kind of what we've been celebrating through this 50th anniversary. We've said, you know, one of the things we wanted to do in these five months is honor uh, those generations that came before us that got us where we are today. And really what we're saying is we're grateful. We're grateful for those original members who came together with a vision to reach this area for Christ and for First Baptist Winter Garden to help plant this church. And so in the 60s with 57, we're grateful, and, and I'm incredibly grateful for that first decade because here's what pastors understand. That first decade really sets the DNA for the rest of the church. If, if during that first decade, if they would have kind of turned inward instead of really having a mission to reach people for Christ, this church probably never would have got more than 200 people. And I thank you today that we've got another congregation out in the foyer drinking awful, I mean, awesome coffee. And uh, I don't know why I said awesome coffee. And uh, they're watching on the flat screen out there. So let's give it up for our other congregation out there. And so today it's about gratitude. And what we're going to see is Paul, as he writes to the church of Philippi, he's going to write about his gratitude for this church that he planted. And in many ways feels like it's a child of his. Uh, Epaphrodites, one of their pastors, has come to Rome to deliver an offering and the word, encouraging word to Paul about what's happening in the church at Philippi. There's some persecution going on there. There is some uh, false doctrine that's trying to be put into the church through the Judaizers, yet the church is remaining faithful. They're staying on mission and reaching people for Christ. And so Paul is writing this letter, sending it back with Epaphrodites back to Philippi. And, and Paul displays his gratitude uh, to the church of Philippi in four ways. First of all, he does it through affirmation. He does it through affirmation, and we see that Paul is affirming the church of Philippi over and over again as he writes them. And, and he tells them, says, man, I, it brings me joy when I think about the way that you're spreading the gospel. And so that first uh, fill in the blank is affirmation. Affirmation, <laughs> all right? <laughs> There we go, affirmation uh, of, the, of the church there in Philippi. And look at what he says in Philippians 4.10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but had no opportunity to show it. He's affirming the fact that the church at Philippi cared for Paul, that the church at Philippi had sent um, Epaphrodites to give them a report. Let me just say this. Affirmation is powerful. Affirmation is powerful. Here's what we know. Children who grow up in homes where they're affirmed in their home are healthier children. They're healthier emotionally. They're healthier relationally. Children who grow up in homes where they're affirmed really do achieve more than, than children who aren't affirmed. They get better educations, they marry better, they tend to make a bigger income after they, they uh, graduate, and, and, and all of that comes through affirmation. Why? Because God wants us 
to share affirmation. It's so easy to get on to our kids when they mess up, isn't it? But what we need to do is find times when they do it right and affirm them because they need to hear our affirmation. Celebrating our seniors today was an act of affirmation. We love you guys. We're going to be praying for you guys when you go to college. Know that we're here for you. But maybe the greatest act of affirmation happens in Matthew chapter 3. And it's when Jesus was baptized, when he's about to start his public ministry. John the Baptist baptizes him. And you remember what happened after that. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. But then God the Father spoke. And he said, that's my boy, right? Now, he didn't say it that way, but that's what he said, all right? Here's what he said. That's my son, whom I am well pleased. And he affirmed his son publicly to model for us the power of affirmation. The second thing Paul is going to do for this church is let them know that you can be great. If to be grateful, not only are you going to, to learn to be uh, affirming to others, but you need to learn to be content. Philippians 4.11, Paul says, I'm not saying this because I am need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Let me encourage you, circle that word learned. Because contentment doesn't come naturally. In fact, outside of a relationship with Christ, I think contentment is impossible. You know, we we aren't content. We want to make a little bit more money, so we get a raise. And now we're content for a month or two. And then it fades, and we're thinking, you know what? I'm better than this. I ought to get a little bit more money. We, we're driving a beater, and we're not content, so we, we go and buy a brand-new car, and now we're content until the brand-new car smell goes away, right? And then it's like it's not so content. And, and we want to have a pool because everybody has a pool, and you live in Central Florida, you need a pool. And so I finally get my pool, and now I'm content until I figure out it takes a lot of work to keep a pool clean and, and maintained, and now I'm not so content. And Paul said, listen, I have learned to be content. And you can only do that through a relationship with Christ. Let me tell you, Paul is sitting in prison in Rome, and he says, I'm content. How can he say that? Here's how. Paul has already told us, he said, look, I know. He said, I wouldn't choose these circumstances, but here's what I know. Because of where I am, the gospel is advancing. It says, for what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And so Paul is saying, look, I wouldn't choose these circumstances, but I can be content. I have joy because I know that God is using these circumstances of mine to advance the gospel. And Paul was living for kingdom purposes and kingdom principles. And because of that, he could have contentment even sitting in prison in Rome. The third thing we're going to need is if you want to have uh, express gratitude, if you want to have joy in your life, you've got to learn to be flexible. You're going to have to learn to be flexible. Notice what Paul said in verse 12. He says, I know what it is to be in need. Well, yeah, he's sitting in prison. Has very little to his name. But he also says, look, I know what it is to have plenty. Paul was a Pharisee. Man, on the road to Damascus, he was a rich guy. He had pretty much anything he wanted in that day. And now, according to world standards, all of that's been taken away. But what he said, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. He says, look, my contentment is not based on circumstances. Sort of like joy, not based on circumstances. And he says, I had to learn to be content, but I have learned to be content. And Paul learned to be flexible that he could have joy in prison or he could have joy planting a church in Philippi and seeing that that young church grow and blossom and bloom. And, And the only way you can do that is to be flexible, to understand, look, there are so many things outside of my control. I don't need to control things. God is sovereignly in control, and I'm just going to be flexible in the places he brings me and and the encounters that he gives me. Uh, When I was a teenager, we went to St. Louis on vacation, and we went up in the Gateway Arch. 
And uh, when we were up there in the arts, the wind was blowing pretty good that day, and the arts was swaying back and forth about five or six inches. You could stand there, and you could feel it going back and forth. Now, I'm a teenage boy, so even though I was scared to death, I couldn't say a word, right? I mean, I had to pretend like this was nothing to this. I was cool. But finally, there was somebody who asked, isn't this dangerous for this thing to be going back and forth like this? We're way up here. And the person who, who was the guide up there said, no, here's what you need to understand. They built this to sway. And, and if they didn't build it to sway, we'd be in trouble. And what they explained was that if they built it rigid so it wouldn't sway, that winds, and I can't remember the exact, you know, what it was, but it was like winds over 80 miles an hour would just snap this in two. But because it sways and it gives, it has the ability to take winds up, I don't know, 140 miles an hour before there's any danger. And I thought about this, that this week. That's exactly how God made us. If we're rigid and have to have everything our way, man, a little storm comes and we're going to snap in two. But when we understand God's in control, he's sovereign, and we're able to be flexible, we can just go with it and take so much more and still have peace and still be content and still have joy in our lives. And then Paul says all of these things lead to a confidence in Christ. And notice what he says in verse 13. He says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, let me say, this is one of the most misused scriptures in all of the Bible. All right? Because when I was growing up, I enjoyed basketball. Believe it or not. This was before all the other friends had their growth spurts, right? And they all started growing and I didn't. Well, I just started claiming I can do all things in Christ. I'm going to dunk that basketball. I can do all things in Christ. Look, I could claim that all day long. I was never going to dunk a basketball, not unless there was a trampoline involved, all right? Um, I, could, I could have aspirations to join the senior tour golf. And let me tell you, I could claim this verse every day, and I ain't going anywhere, right? There's no way I'm going to make the tour. We misuse this verse. What you need to understand is this verse is tied into all the other verses. And here's what Paul is saying. Man, I've shown my gratitude, and I have the ability to affirm. I have the ability to be flexible. I have the ability to, um, uh, to, to uh, be content in everything. Why? Because God gives me the strength to do that. What this verse really ultimately is saying is this. If it's in God's will and he has called you to do it, he will give you the ability to do what he's called you to do. This isn't a blanket verse that you can claim for anything. I didn't study for the test last night, but I'm going to ace it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, you're probably going to fail. Okay, just know that. This is a verse that, is, that tells us that if God has called us to do it, that he will give us the strength to do what he called us to do, that we can learn to be content, that we can learn to be flexible, so what is it that God's called you to do? You know, we've challenged everybody. There should be two people you're praying for that are far away from the Lord. Maybe in the last week or two or the last month, God has kind of been laying on your heart, piercing your heart. Okay, it's good to pray for him, but when are you going to take him out to coffee and share the gospel? Well, God, I can't do that. I don't have... Look, that's when you claim this verse. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Trust God with your marriage. Man, it's tough. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Um, I'm going to trust God with my finances. I'm going to give up a sinful habit and start living for Christ. I can do all things. Why? Because all of those things are within his will for your life. And that's when you claim that verse. Whatever he's leading you to do, he'll give you the strength to get through that. So Paul is, is expressing his gratitude to the church at Philippi, but he's also um, talking about, about how they have blessed him. And, and, and his gratitude is expressed on how they've blessed him in, in three ways. First of all, through their personal compassion. 
And Paul then writes to him and says, Yet it was good to you to share in my troubles. Not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. And Paul is, is grateful, and he's letting the church know, Man, I am grateful for your compassion for me. You see, that church had some issues going on that they were struggling through. They were victorious through it, but, but it was still things that could have been a distraction. But they remembered and they knew Paul was in prison in Rome. And so they took one of their pastors and they sent him to Rome with an offering and, and with words of encouragement and a report on the church because the, a, a healthy church loves and cares for those in the church, but also loves and cares for those outside of the church. There's a word for love that we use in Christian circles called koinonia. And it means a love that's sacrificial. It's different than Philadelphia, which is philos, which is a brotherly love. It's koinonia, which means it's a sacrificial love that we would share for each other. Let me say this. A healthy church has koinonia for those inside of the church and those outside of the church. A healthy church recognizes that all around us are people who are lost who, if they were to die today, they'd spend eternity without Christ. And we'll do everything short of sin to reach them for Christ. Because many churches today, all they do is care about the ones who are already here. That's not koinonia, that's koinonitis. It's a disease. Koinonia says, man, God has given us a mission and we're going to live that mission out. And we're going to reach people and share the gospel. Why? Because we have compassion for everybody. Secondly, he, he expresses his gratitude in their financial generosity. He says, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. What is he talking about? He's not talking about their account here on earth. Here's what he's saying. He's repeating the words of Jesus. He's telling them Jesus' teaching. Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Instead, store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Here's what Paul is reminding them. Whenever you sacrifice, whenever you're generous for the kingdom, you need to know you will be rewarded. That everything that you give uh, for kingdom causes, every gift is recorded and rewarded in heaven. And it really is sending treasure ahead. Here's what the Bible says, that God loves a cheerful giver. He loves people who are generous and, and don't try to find their significance in the things of this world, but in living out their mission for Christ. And then the last thing he's affirming them for is their sacrificial commitment. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Paul is saying when you give sacrificially, that pleases God. Let me tell you, this issue of sacrifice is so important. One day, David um, wanted to build an altar to the Lord to worship him. And, and he was walking, and there's this place where a guy was threshing wheat, and his name was Aaron. And he, he owned this place. He was threshing wheat, and David went up to him and said, I'd like to buy your threshing floor to build an altar so I can worship the Lord. Aaron I said, no, you're the king. He said, look, everything's yours. You don't pay me anything. It's yours. It's an honor to give it to you. And David gave this incredible response. David said, I will not offer unto the Lord anything that costs me nothing. In other words, David said, if there's not sacrifice on my part, it's not worship. And so David says, I'm going to pay you for that. Which, by the way, where that threshing floor was, where David built the altar, was where the, eventually Solomon would build the temple, a place of worship. And what's, what's the outcome of that? Well, here's God's promise, abundant provision. Look at verse 19. Paul says, And my God will need, meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
Again, a misused verse. We can claim that all the time, but here's what Paul is saying. When you learn to live in a way of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude, when you learn to be generous, and when you learn to live sacrificial lives for Christ and for the kingdom, God's going to take care of everything you need. This isn't a promise of name it, claim it, get rich, you know. This is a promise that when we live with an attitude of gratitude, when we are generous to those around us, when we're sacrificial in the way that we live, God honors that, and he will meet all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. The ultimate act that we should display our gratitude with is the cross of Jesus Christ. Because on the cross, God displayed all of this, his love for us, his sacrifice of his son on the cross. And, and, and the gratitude that we should feel because of what the cross has done for our life, to pay for our sins, offer salvation to our lives. We don't earn it or deserve it. We receive it as a gift. All of those things should push us to gratitude which should be displayed in the way that we live, which will produce joy in our lives. Let me just say this. Outside of a relationship, personal growing relationship with Christ, it is impossible to know joy. For some of you today, the first step to joy is to surrender your life to Christ and say, I'm no longer in charge. God, you're in charge. Come and be my Lord and Savior and lead me from this day forward. But I would say for the bulk of those in this room, if you're not feeling joy, it's because you haven't learned to be content. You haven't learned to be flexible. You haven't learned to be grateful for all that God has done for you. And that's where we begin, by saying, God, transform me into the person you want me to be. And when we pray that prayer, we can do all things through him as he molds us and shapes us into the image of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, as we finish this powerful letter, Lord, there's so much in there that, that's just so practical to our lives today. And Lord, everyone in this room, God ultimately desires joy in their lives. And I would pray for those who don't have it today. And and God, uh, who don't have gratitude in their lives and, and aren't generous in their time and their talents and their treasures, I, I pray that, Lord, you would reveal what the stumbling block is. For some, quite honestly, it's probably because they've never fully surrendered to you and they don't know you as their Lord and Savior. But God, we know that the moment we give our lives to you, that God, joy is possible. In fact, that's your desire for our lives. And so if we're not, Lord, we just pray that you would give us contentment um, to live for you, to live for kingdom purposes, and produce your joy in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.